Hello and welcome to season three, episode 19 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa, our 100th episode overall. What an awesome privilege to have been able to share 100 Tuesday nights with all of you. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, coming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa on this winter solstice. We look forward to longer days and the return of our summer migrants from tomorrow. We thought we'd mark our 100th episode and we'd share some of the incredible statistics from the show over its lifespan thus far and these past two and a half seasons. And a big thank you to my co-host Christina Hagen who pulled all of these figures together for us. We have created enough content to span five days and three and a half hours. We've also had an average of 587 live viewers each week from over 25 different countries, enjoying our 97 different presenters who have delivered high quality, informative and enjoyable shows. A huge thank you to the Conservation Conversations team, both on and off screen, especially my co-hosts, Andrew and Christina, for giving up their Tuesday nights to host the show week in and week out. When I started the show back in April, 2020, I had absolutely no idea that it would grow into this vibrant community and become a regular feature on so many of your Tuesday nights. I mean it when I say it, it's an honor and it has certainly been an incredible platform to join all of you in sharing our passion for birds. Thank you for the support as always, and we will continue to learn and enjoy together as we journey into our next 100 episodes. We want to remind all of you that our shows are recorded and available on YouTube, all five days and three hours worth. So if you miss out because the lights go dark, you can always catch up later. And while you're there, please remember to click that subscribe button. We felt as our 100th episode, it would be pertinent to celebrate with a webinar on BirdLife South Africa's most ambitious undertaking, the Mouse Free Marion Project. So joining us this evening will be Dr. Anton Wolfart, Project Manager of the Mouse Free Marion Project, to update us on how it's going with this incredible body of work. But before we dive into our main event, just remember that you can communicate with us in the chat room and the Q&A feeds in Zoom, or you can use that comment feed on Facebook Live. We'll answer questions at the end of tonight's webinar. We are on all major social media channels. You can use that hashtag conservation conversations to let us know what you think of tonight's show or to send your congratulatory messages through. And thanks as always for the generous contributions towards our webinars, which helps keep these shows free for all to learn and enjoy. Visit the Cricket page or EFT BirdLife South Africa directly, and you can use the reference webinars with your name. We are supporting two crowdfunders at the moment, Middlepint wetland is the only confirmed breeding site of the critically endangered white-winged flufftail, and this wetland is facing the threat of cattle trampling its sensitive vegetation. To prevent this, we are raising funds to install a four-kilometer wildlife-friendly fence to keep the cattle out. Please consider supporting the construction of this wildlife-friendly fence, and you can send your donations via the cricket link that I'll post in the chat box shortly. Next week, we are welcoming Dr. Rob Simmons and Dr. Odette Curtis Scott onto our screens to talk about their work on the endangered endemic Black Harrier. In collaboration with the Overberg Renosterfeld Conservation Trust and the EWT, we have partnered to raise support for more tracking devices to help understand the movements of the species across the Western Cape. Please visit the Backer Buddy campaign to support this worthy cause. You can still purchase your limited edition Pride pin badges from our online shop this Pride month. They are just 55 Rand each. All proceeds support our landscape conservation program's work to conserve the diversity of South Africa's terrestrial birds. Jackpot birding is also back. BirdLife South Africa's annual raffle is open and you could win a share of 135,000 Rand. This year we have three prizes. If you clock in on the big first prize, you will take home 100,000 Rand. Second prize will take home 25,000 Rand and third prize 10,000 Rand, not to be scoffed at. And all you have to do is buy a 500 Rand ticket and you have three chances to win. There are only 1,000 tickets available and they are going fast. And lastly, one of Africa's biggest birding events is back, the African Bird Fair 2022. This year we're hosting a hybrid event, meaning the entire program will be available virtually as we have done for the past two years, but you are also welcome to join us at the in-person event at our head office, Isdal House in Dunkeld West, Johannesburg. You can visit BirdLife South Africa's website to find out more and to register. But finally, onto our main event, Dr. Anton Wolfart has spent more than 25 years working on seabirds and marine conservation, 
with his first deployment right onto Marion Island back in 1994. He's come full circle and was appointed the project manager for the Mouse Free Marion project back in 2021. This is definitely the most ambitious project that BirdLife South Africa has ever undertaken. And Anton is going to take us through the project and how it's progressing to share some of his insights from the recent takeover trip that he took down to Marion and also let us know what is planned for the upcoming years. Anton, I don't think there's a better captain for the ship tonight. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I'm now going to hand over to you to share your screen and take us through our 100th episode. Welcome. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, let me just see here. Get this all sorted out. Can you confirm, Melissa, that you're seeing my presentation OK? I can indeed. Over to you, Anton. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. And again, I'd just like to use the opportunity to um, say a massive congratulations to you, Andrew, Christina, and your team for what I think has been an incredible platform um, that's kept many of us interested um, and aware of ongoing interesting conservation projects that relate to birds and conservation more generally. Uh, an incredible achievement, and I wish you all the best for the next uh, 100 episodes. And it's, it's uh, I think, quite a, a privilege to be presenting this 100th episode. Um, it's also perhaps appropriate in a way. Uh, you mentioned earlier that today is the winter solstice here in the Southern Hemisphere. And this midwinter day is traditionally a day that is celebrated on subantarctic and Antarctic um, bases. Um, which are run by a number of countries, including on Marion Island. So it's a time of great festivity because it marks the point at which the days now start becoming longer. Um, the winters can be quite long. The long nights, um, you know, make it quite challenging at times. So uh, looking ahead positively to the future. Um, also, we've many of you will know that we've uh, had a World Albatross Day last week on Sunday the 19th. So again, this is a great opportunity to present um, a, a talk about Marion Island, about this project, which is so directly linked to the conservation of albatrosses and petrels. Um, so thank you very much, Melissa and your team for the opportunity. Um, I know that many of the people listening probably would have participated in the Flock to Marion uh, voyage earlier this year. And so we'll have some connection with Marion Island, but uh, others will not have been, and um, but may know a lot about the, the island through the project and through previous um, conservation initiatives that have been undertaken there. So what I'd like to do this evening is really to provide an overview of um, the project. And it's a, it's a story of a remarkable subantarctic island, which is home to globally important populations of seabirds. But it's also a story about an island which is unfortunately facing a grave threat. Um, so mostly it's a story about a project which aims to address that threat and to restore the ecology of this important island and to ensure a positive conservation future for the many seabirds and other wildlife that call the island home. As Melissa mentioned, I'm lucky enough to be the project manager but, but as with all projects, it is a team effort. And I am presenting tonight on behalf of our team. Um, we have formal members of the team, some of whom are, um, in, are involved in this presentation this evening as panelists, our operations manager, Keith Springer, and our communications officer, uh, Robin Adams, who will be assisting me with um, answering questions that you might have at the end of the presentation. And formally, this project is a collaboration between the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, who are responsible for the management of the, of the island and BirdLife South Africa. Um, and BirdLife South Africa have also established the Mouse Free Marion Nonprofit Company as a vehicle to help facilitate the implementation of this project. But the collaboration and the partnership actually goes even further than that and involves many of you, uh, well, all of you actually, the public, uh, many of you have helped support the project in different ways, uh, from helping with donations to spreading the word of its importance. And I do hope that this presentation inspires you to uh, continue those efforts to support this very worthy cause. So the, what I'm going to do is just kind of provide an initial overview, I think, initially of Marion Island. And it's it might be surprising to all of you that actually 
there are many people in South Africa and many people with a good general knowledge of the geography of South Africa that actually know very little about Marion Island. And if you had to ask the average South African, uh, what is the southernmost territory of South Africa? They would say Cape Agulhas. And, and while that's strictly true from a continental perspective, obviously that excludes these two remote outposts kind of much further south, you know, halfway between Cape Town and Antarctica. And this is the Prince Edward Island group, which comprises two islands, the larger of the two being Marion Island, the satellite image that you see over here, um, at about 300 square kilometers or 30,000 hectares, and about 19 to 20 kilometers northeast of Marion Island is Prince Edward Island, which is considerably smaller at 45 square kilometers. And as I said, these two islands uh, form the Prince Edward Island group, which is part of South African territory. And I think, you know, when I'm presenting to an audience like this, you probably are not representative of the average South African because many of you uh, would have been on the flock to Marion or have an interest in pelagic seabirds and so be very aware of Marion Island. But I thought just for the sake of completeness, to provide some information about its geographic location. And it's, it's um, the Prince Edward Islands are depicted here by this red arrow, and they form part of a group of subantarctic islands that reach up from the floor of the Southern, Southern Ocean and form a ring around the continent of Antarctica. Most of these islands are volcanic in origin. There are not many of them. And um, they and to understand the ecological attributes of these islands and their importance, it's useful to consider the location of these islands within the Southern Ocean. So the bulk of the Southern Ocean moves around the Antarctic continent in an easterly direction um, in an ocean system called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Now there are no land masses in the way to impede the flow of this water. It's an incredibly productive ocean. And Marin Island and Prince Edward Islands um, are located within this Antarctic circumpolar current. Um, and there are two other important features in close proximity to Marion Island or relatively close proximity, which also um, help explain the very high levels of productivity. And these are the Antarctic polar front or convergence to the south of the islands and the subtropical convergence uh, further to the north. And these oceanographic fronts are really important features which um, where different water masses with different densities meet and promote the vertical mixing of water which brings nutrients from the depths of the ocean up to the surface where in the presence of light they can be made available to microscopic um, phytoplankton which can then use these nutrients for photosynthesis and this then forms the basis of incredibly productive food chains and the availability of food in these areas is therefore very, very high, and this results in large aggregations of zooplankton, which in turn attract fish, squid, and top predators such as seabirds, seals, and whales. So you've got these, um, these islands, as I said, that are located within this very extensive area of the Southern Ocean, these productive waters. And these islands are incredible havens for an abundance of wildlife. And the wildlife and especially the marine top predators thrive in these productive waters and although they spend the majority of their time at sea in the case of, of seals and seabirds they do need to come ashore to breed to rest and in some cases to molt and as you would have seen in that last map the number of the islands um, the, these islands within the southern ocean um, is quite limited and so with very few places to choose from, they tend to attract massive aggregations of breeding seabirds and seals, including large aggregations of albatrosses, such as this uh, colony of wandering albatrosses here and some uh, colonies of king penguins. And so Marion Island is particularly important, the Prince Edward Islands for, for albatrosses and albatrosses are arguably the most charismatic of the seabirds that breed on the island. There are five species in total that breed on both Marriott or breed on the Prince Edward Islands. Uh, four of those breed on both the islands, and one, the Indian Yellownose Albatross, only breeds on Prince Edward Island. And uh, so you have the wandering albatross, and in fact, collectively, the Prince Edward Islands support almost half of all the world's wandering albatrosses, with Marion Island alone supporting a quarter of the global population. So that makes it an incredibly important site and provides and, 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 and means that South Africa have an incredible obligation in terms of global albatross conservation kind of um, priorities 
to make sure that this island is a safe haven for these species. We have gray-headed albatrosses, which Melissa mentioned earlier, is one of her favorite albatross species. We have both light-mantled and sooty albatrosses. And, um, and then, of course, the Indian yellow-nosed albatross, which breeds only on Prince Edward. And of course, in addition to the um, charismatic albatrosses, we have the popular penguins, large colonies of king penguins and smaller and more dispersed colonies of gentoo penguins, together with two species of eudiptid or crested penguins, the, the macaroni penguin shown on the left and the eastern rock upper penguin on the right. And so while these surface nesting birds that I've shown, and there are others such as skuas and the Kaguelan and Antarctic terns and the giant petrels, um, are perhaps the most visibly dominant of the seabirds on the island. There are many more seabirds that breed under the surface in burrows, and most of these are birds that will return to the island at night to avoid predation by species such as skuas and giant petrels. So these are species such as the white chin petrel you see over here, and others such as great wing petrels and gray petrels and prions and, and, and blue petrels, etc. Many of the species that those of you who uh, participated in the Flock to Marion would have seen during that voyage. And the island is important not only for seabirds, but for marine mammals as well. Um, the islands and the surrounding waters provide very important habitat for a number of, of seal species, two species of fur seal. The species that you see on the left-hand side over here is the subantarctic fur seal. Um, and the island is also important for Antarctic fur seals. Um, and also important populations of southern elephant seals that breed on the island. And the waters offshore of the island provide important feeding habitats for um, populations of, of orcas or killer whales. So, so an incredibly important site for um, top marine predators that must come ashore uh, in the case of seals and seabirds to breed and to rest and in some cases to molt. And in fact, it was the marine mammals that motivated the first human landings on the island. Although the islands were discovered long before, it wasn't until the end of the 18th century that the first actual landings on the island were made. And this was at a time when there was a large demand for fur skill skins. And like uh, was the case on many of the other subantarctic islands, Antarctica, and even uh, in areas of Southern Africa uh, with um, the Cape fur seals. There were seal hunters that were arriving at the islands to exploit this resource. And elephant seals were also killed in large numbers so that the blubber could be rendered down into oil in these uh, cast iron tripods that you see in the photograph over here. And this was a very destructive industry. It led to the populations of these exploited species being driven down to low numbers very quickly. And, um, and so this led to the cessation of this exploitation by about the 1850s, so not a very long lasting industry. Uh, fortunately, uh, many of the exploited seal populations have since recovered. And, and this is a principle and a theme that I'll come back to um, in the course of this presentation, is that if given the opportunity to recover from threats, if those threats are no longer in place, and the species are not suffering from many other threats, it's incredible how resilient these wildlife populations can be if given the opportunity to recover from these, um, these factors that do threaten the populations. However, unfortunately, in the case of these early um, exploitation of seal populations, what often happened was that these, um, these sealers um, had other impacts on the islands and that were additional to the direct impacts that they had on the targeted species that they were exploiting. Uh, and sealers brought with them stowaways in the form of rodents, and many of the islands that they visited to exploit these populations were then um, exposed to uh, rodent populations which um, came aboard these vessels, arrived on the islands, and found that there were no predators and there was an amazing source of food which was available to them. And in the case of the Prince Edward Islands, unfortunately, this led to the accidental introduction of house mice on Marion Island, but fortunately not on neighboring Prince Edward Island. And, and this has led to a devastating impact on the ecology of Marion Island, which forms the main thrust of the Mass Free Marion project and forms the main kind of uh, topic of this presentation that I'm giving this evening. <clears throat> so following the, um, the era of direct exploitation, the sealing era, 
human activities on Marion Island declined. And there were very few visits made between the 1850s and about 1947. And it was in 1947 that the islands were occupied by South Africa, mainly for strategic reasons. And the following year in 1948, the islands were formally annexed by the South African government. And at that point, a weather station was established on Marion Island. And this annexation really marked the beginning of a new era for the island, an era that moved away from direct exploitation to an era of research that eventually kind of then developed into an era of conservation management. And although the strategic importance of the island is still recognized, um, today the Prince Edward Islands are valued primarily for their role in science, in research and conservation. Um, as I indicated in the previous slide, um, a weather station was established very soon after the islands were annexed by South Africa. And the meteorological observations that have been undertaken ever since without a break um, represent amongst the longest continuous records for the region and continue to provide really important information that have provided incredibly important insights into ongoing climate change. And unfortunately, another principle of the um, that I'll be coming to quite often during this presentation is that this is an area that's subject to quite drastic climate changes, which have an impact on both the mouse populations and the seabirds, which are impacted by them and other manifestations of climate change. And when one looks at the research and monitoring and conservation activities, you see that there have been different phases of this research. In the early days, it was very much a kind of reconnaissance baseline kind of survey expeditions. And that's then kind of evolved into uh, more applied conservation research, uh, looking at global environmental change and conservation issues on the island's ecosystem. And we're in a very fortunate position that many of these research programs have been ongoing for decades. And, and South Africa, many of you might not realize this, but South Africa has an incredibly proud record as a leading nation in um, Antarctic and subantarctic research, especially given the research that's been going ongoing for 40 years or more on Marion Island. And many of the people that are involved in our project, people like John Cooper and Peter Ryan, have been instrumental in initiating and continuing this work together with many others. So it, it is an incredibly proud record, as I say, and something that we as South Africans can be very proud of. And as Melissa mentioned in the introduction, my own career as a seabird and island conservation practitioner started at Barren Islands some 28 years ago when I was fortunate enough to be part of the 51st overwintering team from 1994 to 1995. Uh, I was employed as a seabird field researcher, working mostly on penguins, but also on other seabirds on the island, including the albatrosses and petrels. And as with most people who get to visit the island, and especially those of us who've been incredibly privileged to overwinter there, the experience was a profound one for me and really set the course for the rest of my career and the years that followed. And I know I see that there are some others um, participating in the webinar tonight that have also overwintered. And I'm sure they would agree that it is a life-changing experience. This is a place which has a massive impact on you. And researchers that visit the island are invariably inspired to return and to contribute to the conservation of the island. And this has really led to the um, ongoing nature of many of these long-term programs that have yielded and continue to yield incredibly important, globally important scientific findings. So from a personal perspective to become formally involved in the islands again after all these years, and especially to become involved in a project which is so fundamentally important to the conservation of the islands is indeed a great privilege. So I mentioned earlier that you know, given the small number of islands that occur within this vast productive Southern Ocean, they are havens for abundance, an abundance of wildlife. But not only are they havens, these islands are considered globally important for seabirds and for other subantarctic biodiversity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, collectively, the Prince Edward Islands support almost half of all of the world's wandering albatrosses with Marion alone, um, being uh, su supporting about a quarter of the global population. So it just really highlights how important um, these islands are for seabird conservation. 
And this is formally recognized internationally by BirdLife International in having designated the Prince Edward Islands as an important bird area. The South African government have also recognized the importance of the island and in 1995 declared the island, uh, the islands, a special nature reserve. And many of you probably aren't familiar with the designation special nature reserve, and that's because there are not many of them around. It's the highest level of protection for protected areas within the South African legislation. And it is my understanding that it is the only special nature reserve in South Africa. It's also a um, designated or declared Ramsar site, so a wetland of international importance. So truly a jewel in the crown of South Africa's protected area system, and one which we should be very proud of. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not quite the safe haven that it used to be, and it is indeed facing a grave and unfortunate threat. As I mentioned earlier, an unfortunate byproduct of the early human visitation of the islands was the accidental introduction of mice by those early sealing parties. These mice were accidentally introduced um, early in the 1800s. We don't know exactly when, but from records, uh, we know that they arrived sometime before 1818, um, presumably as stowaways on the vessels of these early sealers. So the mice have been on the island for a couple of hundred years and unfortunately have wreaked havoc on the system. And we know this because, as I mentioned earlier, we have a number of long-term research and monitoring programs which have been able to demonstrate the impact that these mice are having. I also mentioned earlier that, fortunately, the neighboring island in this island group, Prince Edward Island, has escaped such introductions and has remained free of introduced vertebrates, introduced predators. And, and this is good and important from a number of perspectives. It's important because it means that this island, Prince Edward, which you see in this photograph, this is a photograph taken from Marion Island looking across at Prince Edward Island. It's important because it means that Prince Edward Island is relatively pristine. In fact, it's considered to be one of the most pristine islands in the Southern Ocean. Um, there are a couple of in, uh, alien plant species but other than that, the island has fortunately been able to escape introductions of most of the invasive species which have impacted Marin Island, including mice. Um, secondly, it's important because it provides us with a benchmark. It provides us with a reference point of what an island in this part of the Southern Indian Ocean should um, look like, should function like. And so we can use that as a reference point to assess the impacts that mice have had on Marin Island and to also <clears throat> um, to monitor the progress and the ecological outcomes that um, occur as a result of the eradication of mice on Marion Island. So mice are not the only introduced predator which have impacted um, Marion Island. The mice had been on the island for about, or for over hundred years, by the time South Africa annexed the island in 1949 and established a weather station there. And in those early years after annexation, uh, mice proved to be a bit of a nuisance for the teams that were overwintering in the base. Um, and at the time, it must have seemed like a good idea to bring along a few domestic cats that could help deal with, this, with the pesky mice that were causing them all sorts of nuisance. And to us now, this seems like a highly irresponsible action and would certainly not be permitted today, but there were different times and uh, there were different mindsets, the kind of conservation sort of attitudes and mindsets were quite different in those days. And unfortunately, and unsurprisingly, as we would all predict, those five domestic cats soon left the comfort of the, the base at Marion Island and discovered an abundance of food across the island in the form of naive seabirds and especially the burrowing petrels. And um, these birds were literally sitting ducks. Um, seabirds have evolved on islands in the absence of terrestrial predators. And so they simply have no defense mechanism against them. And so these birds, the, sorry, the cats um, increased in number. And by the 1970s, it was estimated that there were some 2000 cats roaming on Marion Island, killing almost 500,000 seabirds every single year. Um, and this is, you know, clearly this was going to have a massive impact on the seabed populations of Marion Island. Fortunately, uh, given the impact that cats were having on the island, uh, South Africa and especially a few maverick scientists and conservation, 
conservationists started discussing the possibility of eradica eradicating cats from Marion Island. And at the time, many considered that this was too challenging a prospect. Nobody had considered eradicating cats from an island anywhere near the size of Marion at the time. But through a systematic, scientific, and persistent approach, cats were successfully eradicated from Mar Marion Island by 1991. It took a multitude of different methods, um, and it took a period of time, but it was largely through the leadership and the vision of Professor Matan Bester and others that they decided that this was something that could happen if they just applied themselves properly and should happen because of the importance of removing cats to safeguard the conservation future of the island. And the successful eradication of cats from Marin Island was an incredible feat, which I think has gone underreported and is perhaps under-recognized in South Africa. But in um, South Antarctic conservation circles, South Africa certainly <clears throat> set an example for others to follow. And up until very recently, Marion Island remained the largest island on which cats have been eradicated by an order of magnitude. Um, that record has since been surpassed by an island of the west coast of Australia, but it was a record held for many, many years, and it took the vision, the foresight, and the dedication of um, the South African scientists and conservation practitioners. And it's certainly something that we as the project team uh, for the Master of Marion project have been inspired by and want to echo in our own project and kind of follow their example. Of course, the methods and approaches are all quite different. This project took place over the course of some 15 years, whereas ours, um, the planning takes a while, but the actual eradication operation itself uh, needs to be done over a more distinct period of time. And I'll get to that shortly. So with the cats eradicated, um, the introduced mice then became the only um, introduced predator on the island. And I mentioned before that there are a number of really important and useful ongoing long-term research projects that have been undertaken at Marion Island. And this has enabled us to have a very good understanding of, for example, the impacts of mice on the terrestrial ecology of Marion Island. And the first thing to say is that mice are highly adaptable and voracious omnivores that reproduce very rapidly in ideal conditions and can eat almost anything in such quantity that they can essentially alter the ecological processes and drive an island into a state of ecological impoverishment. And so there were a number of studies and PhD theses that were undertaken to understand the impacts of mice on Marion Island. And prior to the early 2000s, a number of these studies highlighted the negative impacts that mice were having, especially on the terrestrial invertebrates and the vegetation of the island. Um, so mice prey on terrestrial invertebrates such as this flightless moth over here. This is an endemic species to the Prince Edward Islands, and the mice feed on the caterpillars of this flightless moth. And the big problem on Marion is that um, you would think that perhaps the, uh, the mouse population had been controlled by the feral cats. And while they, there might be an element of truth in that, what we're finding is that the mouse population has, over the last 30 to 40 years, increased dramatically to the extent that the population is now considered to be, at the peak of the summer densities, some 500% greater than it was um, 30, 40 years ago. And this is largely due to changes in the climate. It's largely due to a warmer and drier climate. Mice are not particularly well adapted to the cold, wet winters of Marin Island. So as the climate has become warmer and drier, which has been doing fairly rapidly at Marion Island, this has increased the um, period of time that the mice can breed. And this obviously hugely increases the densities. And this uh, increase has then led to uh, an increased impact on the um, invertebrate prey on which the mice were feeding to the extent that the caterpillar of the flightless moth, and this, flightless, this endemic flightless moth species that I've shown over here, is now considered to be um, at a level that is 10% of its original numbers, and that is due directly to the predation impacts of mice. Um, and that's important not only from a biodiversity perspective, you know, we obviously don't want to lose an endemic species, but it's also important from an ecological process point of view, because these and other invertebrates that the mice have been preying on are really important for ecological processes such as nutrient cycling. And so this massive reduction in their biomass has 
essentially undermined uh, this important ecological process. And the reason I've shown a photograph of a lesser sheath bull, which is a shorebird closely related to oyster catchers, um, is that the, the mice have also been shown by um, long-term research by Anna Hazer and Alan Berger and others to have an impact on lesser sheath bulls. And this is because in the winter months, when most of the penguins and other seabirds on which the lesser sheath bulls scavenge in the summer months have left the island, Traditionally uh, and historically, the sheath bulls would forage inland on terrestrial invertebrates. But given the massive increase in the densities of mice um, and the impact that they've had on driving the um, reduction in the biomass of the invertebrates, that has resulted in um, exploitative competition with the sheath bulls and has led to reductions in their breeding success and survival. And then, unfortunately, in the at the start of the 21st century, something shifted. It was in 2003 that there was the first record of mice attacking and eating alive surface nesting seabirds, such as the albatrosses, as the, as the spray-headed albatross over here. And in fact, the first record was of a wandering albatross. Uh, and this, was, this came about presumably as the invertebrate food resources of the mice was dwindling and the mice uh, densities continue to increase and they were now becoming desperate and were resorting to finding other sources of protein, which they found in the form again of these naive seabirds. And as I mentioned earlier with respect to cat predation, these birds are just literally sitting ducks. They have no defense mechanisms because they've evolved on islands without natural terrestrial predators. And so they are just, are, are, yeah, as I say, exposed to these voracious predators who are highly adaptable are now looking, are overshooting the terrestrial invertebrate prey and are looking for other forms of, of nutrition. So initially these observations were relatively localized and uh, infrequent, but as I will show, um, unfortunately, these observations have become more extensive and become, and the impacts of mice on surface nesting seabirds such as these albatross has become more significant and extensive. And what I'm going to show now in the next image is perhaps um, I should just um, preempt it with a bit of a warning that it's not for sensitive viewers, but I think it's important to show. And this is video footage taken by Ross Wanless and Andrea Angel um, at Goff Island of a Tristan Albatross chick. Uh, very similar um, predation takes place at Marion on the Albatross um, species that I've mentioned already. But it really visually kind of just kind of illustrates what is happening. Uh, it's, uh, it must be an incredibly agonizing and um, distressing way to, uh, to sort of to see your end. But I think it's important to show. So if please sensitive viewers perhaps um, turn away from your screen for now. And you can see, again, while the bird might seem irritated by the swarm of mice kind of coming all over it, it is unable to deter this, uh, this swarm of mice from continuing to eat away at its soft parts. And um, yeah, can you imagine a more distressing way to, to see the end of your life? And uh, what tends to happen is that, you know, night after night, these mice would, um, these, these, these mice will continue attacking these vulnerable um, seabird chicks. And eventually these chicks that are orders of magnitude larger than the mice that are attacking them will succumb just out of sheer um, exhaustion and uh, fatigue. Uh, and often through uh, complications, through infections, et cetera. And I mentioned earlier that um, initially these observations were um, infrequent and localized, but unfortunately, increasing evidence shows that um, the frequency and extent of mouse attacks on seabirds, both in terms of the areas on the island and the range of species, has continued to increase. And there's now an increasing body of evidence from Marin that the scale and significance of these impacts uh, is becoming more severe and will continue as climate change continues to provide more uh, favorable conditions for mice. And um, not only are the albatrosses and petrels directly impacted through predation of their eggs, chicks, and even in some cases, adult birds, but as I mentioned earlier, the impacts of mice are having an impact at the ecosystem level due to the ecological processes such as nutrient cycling and soil turnover, which are being compromised. So essentially these, these mice are eating the island into a state of ecological crisis. And 
in addition to the direct observations, the, the work that people like um, Peter and Ben Dilley and others have done, um, there's also evidence from the burrowing petrol kind of surveys that have been done both on Barren Island and Prince Edward Island, again by Peter, Ben and, and their co-workers. As I mentioned earlier, the cats had a massive impact on the burrowing petrol populations, decimated many of the population, caused the local extinction of some of the smaller burrowing, burrowing uh, petrol species on Marin. But it's now been 30 years since the uh, feral cats were eradicated from Marion Island, and one would have expected that there would have been a recovery of those burrowing petrol populations on Marion Island in the absence of cats. And, and work by Peter and Ben and others has shown that this unfortunately hasn't been the case. While there were some limited and short-term indications of um, recovery of some species, such as the great winged petrels, uh, immediately after the cats were eradicated, this has not been sustained. And the reason for this is that the recovery of these burrowing petrol populations is being suppressed by the impacts of mice. Work that Ben and others have done have shown that especially the winter breeding species, their breeding success is far lower than you would expect um, on Marion Island. Um, and that is due to the impacts that, the, that mice pred mouse predation must be having on the eggs and chicks of these species. So just looking at how this is being presented in the, um, in the media out there on websites. And sadly, if you Google Marion Island albatross, this is the first image comes up. It's quite a, an incredible image. It's an image by um, Thomas Peschak, which um, shows the sculpt um, gray-headed albatross, which, and as you have seen earlier, I included a quote from Thomas in the National Geographic article that uh, he photographed for, where he indicated that it's, it's quite macabre to be walking around in this landscape, which, which is dominated by green and gray and black colors. And you come around into this colony and you suddenly see these red colors, which are these skull birds. And in fact, <clears throat> this is not only the first image, but all five images hereafter um, that you see when you type in um, Marion Island Albatross into a Google search image, will be of sculpt images, uh, sorry, sculpt albatrosses, which is quite a sad reflection for an island, as I say, as, uh, is considered to be globally important for seabird conservation. And the issue has been receiving uh, increased international attention and prominence. Uh, and following the National Geographic article for which Thomas provided the photographs, the island was dubbed the island of the zombie mouse, which again is a bit of a, a sad reflection on an island which we should be talking about in much more positive terms. But it does highlight the importance of the issue that we need to address to ensure that we restore the integrity of this island and re restore it to its former glory. So I've, I've shown some images of individual birds that have been impacted, uh, individual birds that have been sculpted, that have been killed as a result of mass predation. And you might ask, well, you know, perhaps from a conservation perspective, that isn't a problem uh, as long as it doesn't impact the populations of these species. And we all know that many seabird populations face multiple threats, both at sea and on land. And <clears throat> Peter, Ben, um, and um, Guy Preston and others undertook an exercise a few years ago where they looked at the populations of seabirds on Marion Island. And there are 28 species that have been recorded breeding on the island. There's a 29th, which is considered to be a possible breeder. That's the black-bellied storm pestrel. Um, but of the 28 species that have been recorded breeding, when one considers their susceptibility to mouse predation and one considers the likely trajectory of the uh, mouse population, um, they predicted that of those 28 species, the majority, that's 18 species, are likely to face local extinction in the next 30 to 100 years. That is an incredibly scary prognosis. And in order to prevent these losses and restore Marion Island and its ecosystems back to their former glory, clearly the eradication of mice from this island is absolutely essential. And I thought I'd put this in. Uh, there's been a paper that's just recently been published, and some of you might have seen news of this in the last couple of days. Um, and, and this paper has shown that 
in fact, the impacts that mice have on these long-lived albatross species is probably worse than we have quantified in previous estimates. And this is because it's very difficult to work with long-lived species. Most of what we do is we look at their breeding success and survival of adult birds. And because the large majority of the population, the, the juveniles and the immature birds and the subadult birds, spend most of their time away from the colony um, until they return to recruit back into the living population, it's an important part of the population which we we actually know very little about or much less about than we do about uh, than we do compared to the breeding population. And this study has shown that when one considers that um, component of the population, in fact the impacts of mouse predation on these long-lived albatrosses are actually much greater than we had previously thought, really just highlighting the importance of addressing this threat. So a lot of reasons to be concerned about the impacts of mice on the seabirds and the ecology of Marin Island. But the very good news is that this is an issue and a threat that can be solved. Introduced predators can be removed from islands, even islands the size of Marian Island. And this is not something that would have been considered viable when I was in Marion Island some 28 years ago, but there have been huge improvements in um, the methodologies that have been used and the technology available to now pave the way for increasingly ambitious and successful projects. And our New Zealand colleagues have really paved the way in this regard. They've got more than their fair share of introduced um, predators and pests on their islands, and they've had to innovate ways of safeguarding their indigenous species on the kind of offshore islands and the main islands of both North and South um, Island of New Zealand. And so this, as I say, has really kind of paved the way for operations such as Marion to be considered a possibility. And I say that there is a solution, um, but there aren't many options in that solution. And aerial broadcasting of a specially formulated rodenticide bait by helicopters has become the standard method used in rodent eradications on islands and is simply the only method that has proven successful on large oceanic islands such as Marin Island. And to provide a bit of a sense of the, um, the approach that one uses, I've provided some photographs here um, of an operation on South Georgia, which is an island that I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. And this is really just to illustrate the basics of the operation. And essentially, a fleet of helicopters is used to sew the specially formulated redundancy bait from underslung bait buckets across the entire island. And it's important that every single mass territory is covered. We're talking here about an eradication operation, an operation in which we need to remove every single individual. If we were to remove 99.5% of the population, uh, that in control circumstances or control operations might be considered to be highly effective, but for an eradication operation, unfortunately, would be considered a failure. And, and we need to cover the entire island from the coast and coastal cliffs all the way up to most of the highest peaks of the island twice to ensure that the bait persists for long enough to complete the task. Now, as I mentioned earlier, integral to this task and integral to the reason why we now able to consider a project like the Samarian Island is the um, technological advancements associated with um, geographical um, positioning systems, GPSs, and geographical information systems, GIS, that enable precision flying lines to be, to be planned, flown, and monitored in almost real time. So Marion Island remains a hugely challenging island on which to undertake an eradication operation. And so we absolutely need to use proven methods and proven products. And on Marion Island and other large islands, there simply is no other solution other than using um, rodenticide bait and applying this early. And as I mentioned, and it's, it's useful just to reiterate this point, is that all it takes is a few mice or even one pregnant female not to eat the bait or to die as a result of consuming the bait for the operation to be a failure. This really is an all or nothing affair. So the operations that have preceded ours have helped inform our own planning. Each operation and each island has its own set of challenges, the outcomes of which have helped refine the various tools and the approaches. And if you look at the list that I provided here, except for South Georgia, 
Marion Island will be the largest island cleared of mice in a single operation, and it will be the largest island on which mice are the only introduced predator at which an eradication attempt is being made. And South Georgia is, in some respects, a bit of an, uh, a, a bit of an exception. It's uh, a very large island, but the island is um, can, can be separated into separate compartments by means of the glaciers that go down to the sea level. This certainly didn't make it um, any less challenging a prospect, but it enabled the operation to be undertaken in different phases over several years, rather than in, uh, all in one go, which is what we need to do for Marion Island and most other island operations. So Marion is challenging because of its size, the shape, its remoteness, and the typically inclement weather conditions during the winter time and throughout the year, in fact, um, but uh, in winter when we'll be undertaking the operation. So this is just a, a useful illustration to, to show that um, there have been stepwise advances in the methods and the technology and the skills and the knowledge that has been developed that have informed and enabled increasingly more ambitious projects to be undertaken, undertaken successfully. This is a, an illustration that has been prepared by New Zealand colleagues for a feasibility study that they've undertaken for the Auckland Islands in New Zealand, which are even larger than Aran Island, and in which um, an eradication attempt uh, for a number of pest species is being planned and considered. <clears throat> So it, it's all very well to say, well, you know, we know that other islands have done it. We know that the tools are now available and we know that kind of feasibly or theoretically we could undertake an operation like this on Marion Island. We do know that the Marion project will be hugely challenging. As I mentioned before, its size, the shape, its remote location, the inclement weather conditions all contribute to making this a very challenging task. However, we know that it will be achievable. A feasibility study that was undertaken by a New Zealand expert has confirmed that this uh, that it is technically feasible to eradicate mice from Marion Island as long as we follow best practice. We know what the challenges are, and so we are in the process of planning to address, to mitigate, and prepare contingency plans for those for those um, for those challenges that we will encounter. And in projects and initiatives like this, we use. Um, examples of previous operations. So um, we published information, previous experience on other islands, on-site research at Marion Island, close collaboration with international experts, experts such as the Island Eradication um, Advisory Group, and peer review from groups like that continue to inform the planning for the Mars for Marion project and to ensure that our project is based on current best practice approaches. And one of the important um, best practice principles expertise. And we fortunately the, um, the project manager for the Macquarie Island operation, which led to the successful eradication of rabbits, rats, and mice, and has been involved in many, many other uh, rodent eradication projects and, and pest eradication projects on subantarctic islands. And so we are very privileged um, and consider him to be a vital part of our team. And um, just really to highlight again that the eradication techniques and approaches that we will be using are, are neither novel nor experimental. Um, Clearly, we refine them for use on Marion Island because every island is different. But these methods and approaches are the culmination of, of more than 30 years of development and implementation involving hundreds of successful rodent eradication operations on islands around the world. And this just is, a, is an infographic prepared by Robin, our communications assistant, which uh, really kind of illustrates um, the, the task that we have, why it's important and provides a little bit of information about the project itself. And just to kind of highlight that the solution to this problem on Marion Island is relatively straightforward. We need to eradicate the mice. However, the operation to do so is a lot more complex in reality, mainly because of the island's remoteness, the size, the harsh conditions, and many of the other factors. 
that I have already mentioned. But these are all issues that we are carefully and actively considering in our planning to make sure that we have the best chance of success. And so one of those, um, one, one of those um, challenges relates to the logistics of an operation like this. And I'm sure you can imagine um, having to transport four to six helicopters with the bait that we'll need, um, the team and the various other equipment and suppliers to an island which is 2,000 kilometers away from Cape Town um, and which experiences um, challenging weathers, weather conditions at the best of times is a very challenging project. Um, there are a number of other um, challenging components, but again, we build on lessons learned from previous operations and we ensure that we have good plans in place to um, to respond to, to address, and to deal with all of these such that our planning is meticulous and to the extent that we, um, we are well prepared for every eventuality. And I've mentioned before that um, the only method that has proven successful in eradicating rodents from these large oceanic islands is through the aerial, uh, the aerial broadcast of rodenticide through helicopters. And I'm sure, uh, and I often do get asked the question, and it is a very important question, is so what about other species? The, the toxin within the bait um, is not specific to mice. Um, and there is obviously a possibility that there are non-target species which might be impacted by the baiting operation. And indeed, most eradication projects using rodenticide have resulted in some level of mortality for some non-target species. However, it's important to note that in all of these projects, the short-term mortality impacts have been far outweighed by the overall ecological benefits of the operation. And it's important just to kind of highlight very clearly here that these issues are being very carefully considered in our project planning. Overall, we have a good enough understanding of the effects of non-target species based on previous operations on similar islands and of an understanding of the ecology of seabirds and ecotoxicology on islands like Marin to enable planning that um, ensures that we minimize impacts on susceptible, susceptible non-target species. And we've also um, established an independent expert advisory panel to undertake an assessment of the non-target species impacts that will help inform the planning for our operation. And this um, advisory panel is chaired by Professor Peter Ryan, who I'm sure is familiar to all of you and includes a number of um, global experts in their respective fields from eradication practitioners to ecotoxicologists, um, seabed scientists that are familiar with um, the species at Marion Island and in the Southern Ocean uh, Islands more generally. Um, and then Keith and myself are on as ex officio members really just to provide feedback to them. So this is work that is ongoing and, um, and uh, just uh, is important to ensure that our plans make sure that the operation proceeds on the basis that the long-term ecological benefits uh, far outweigh any short-term and reversible uh, impacts on non-target species. And then I'm sure you can imagine that a project like this has to go through a number of processes to get regulatory approval, to get consents, authorizations, exemptions from uh, a very strict management plan, which is in place, um, permits from the Department of Agriculture and Land Reform and Rural Development, uh, permissions and ongoing engagement with the South African Civil Aviation Authority regarding the helicopter operations. And these processes are all underway. They take time and they can be quite complex and are important. It's important that we um, demonstrate that we have considered all of the various issues and have plans in place that address concerns that people might have and that there is confidence in the fact that we are going to achieve the positive outcomes while at the same time minimizing any um, potential negative impacts that uh, the project might have. And then I mentioned earlier that with respect to the marine mammal populations, the fur seal and elephant seal populations that were directly exploited, that if given the opportunity, wildlife populations are incredibly resilient and re can recover from impacts and threats. And seabird populations are similarly resilient. And I'd like to use the example of the spectacled petrel, which as many of you will know, I'm sure, breeds on only one site in the world, uh, inaccessible island in the South Atlantic. And some of you might not be aware that this species came very close to being wiped out completely by feral pigs that were on the island. But fortunately, um, the pigs died out before they ate the last of the petrels. 
And since then, work by Peter Ryan and his colleagues has shown that the population has been increasing at a level of about 7% per annum, despite the mortality associated with uh, fisheries impacts, especially fisheries that are fishing off the coast of the west coast of South America. So this is quite remarkable and, and really kind of, again, just highlights the resilience of these, um, these populations that have been impacted by factors which, if removed, um, these populations can actually rebound from amazingly. And I think it also highlights that for most of the issues that threaten seabirds, we know what the solutions are, we know what to do to solve these problems. And there are many examples of how interventions have made a difference at a local level. And I think the challenge in conservation is that we just we need the societal and the political will to implement these solutions more broadly. And this kind of speaks to a project like Marion as well. It's an incredibly challenging project, but a project that we know will yield incredible conservation returns. And indeed, eradication of introduced predators from islands um, is one of those examples of effective conservation interventions. And there are many examples of um, uh, rodent eradications on islands where the species that were impacted show spectacular recovery and rebounding once those introduced predators have been removed. And I'd like to use one example, which is the island of South Georgia. And I mentioned earlier that South Georgia is a massive island. It's substantially larger than Marion Island. And the only way that um, this um, restoration of South Georgia was made possible was, as I said earlier, as a result of the glaciers which divide the island into separate compartments. But notwithstanding that benefit, it was still an incredibly um, challenging um, project to undertake. There were both brown or Norway rats on South Georgia and house mice in a couple of small areas. And these were having a massive impact. And there were concerns that as the glaciers retreated, those impacts would become even more severe. And so a very small um, UK-based charity called the South Georgia Heritage Trust decided that they were going to take on the eradication of all of those rodents, both the Norway rats and the house mice in South Georgia. And over the course of three to five years, they were successful in achieving that outcome, which is incredible. I mean, they were facing many challenges, and I'm sure that there were many that thought it was, again, too challenging a prospect. But that was a successful outcome. And I, I'd like to include a slide here, which features somebody who I've got a massive amount of respect for, and somebody who perhaps is known to some of you. Uh, her name is Sally Ponce. And Sally Ponce is somebody who has dedicated her life to the conservation of South Georgia and its wildlife inhabitants. And I know that phrase is used quite often, but it really is the case with Sally. She has uh, been visiting South Georgia most years for the last 40 years or more. Um, her oldest child was actually born in South Georgia, and she's absolutely passionate about the conservation of the islands. And she's somebody who I've been fortunate to spend time with in South Georgia and the Falklands, um, and I've spoken to her um, in recent times about the Marion Project and about the South Georgia Project. And I've included a quote here from Sally from a recent um, New York Times article, where she just speaks um, with inspiration and, and, and just kind of um, incredible insight about what it's like to be visiting South Georgia in the years following the eradication operation here. And she says very simply that we are able to do good. We're able to reverse the impacts that we have inadvertently caused historically. Uh, and South Georgia provides an example of that. Um, so it really does um, provide us with some inspiration and um, you know we have the opportunity to achieve this outcome for Marion Island. As I mentioned this is a, a partnership between BirdLife South Africa and the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment and um, we're working really hard to achieve a similar conservation legacy. We do have a lot to do before we undertake the operation, um, in particular the need to raise a substantial amount of funding to undertake the work and uh, we're very grateful for the support that we've already received including from many of you and do hope that you will consider spreading the word and consider it, um, helping support the project further. And the project itself has also received endorsement from a number, including, you know, in addition to Sally, who has talked fondly about um, the, the positive repercussions for an island like South Georgia. The, Marian, the Mouse Free Marine Project has received endorsement from important uh, supporters, such as our Minister Barbara Creasy, 
um, Tony Martin, Professor Tony Martin, who was the leader of the um, the project at South Georgia, which eradicated the um, the rats and the mice there, from um, the Honourable Grace Michelle, um, who we all know very well as the um, previous wife of both Nelson Mandela and the former First Lady of Mozambique, um, Patricia Zarita, the Chief Executive Officer of BirdLife International. Professor John Cloxel, um, who has spent most of his career at the British Antarctic Survey, a world expert on uh, South Georgia seabirds and of subantarctic islands and seabirds more broadly. And uh, um, Peter Harrison, who many of you will know as one of the world's experts on seabirds and somebody incredibly passionate about uh, albatrosses and about um, albatross conservation and about the importance of this project uh, to conserve Marion Island as an important um, breeding site for wandering albatrosses and other species globally. So there are two reasons why there's some urgency to um, eradicate mice from Marion Island, over and above minimizing the long-term population impacts and reducing the suffering and distress caused to countless birds that will only increase in future years if mice are not removed. And the first is that the, the mice and the mouse impacts are going to increase as the climate ameliorates further. As the climate becomes warmer and drier, more favorable for mice, um, the mouse densities will continue to increase. They will continue to outstrip the invertebrate prey and they will continue to increase the, um, the extent to which they resort to feeding on the albatrosses and burying petrels of the island. And perhaps even more critically, a warmer and drier climate is likely to extend the breeding season of mice on Marion and reduce the window of opportunity that we have available to undertake the baiting operation. And I think it's really important to say at this point that we're still lucky on Marion that we have seabirds left on the island. We still have viable populations of species such as this gray-headed albatross over here and these wandering albatrosses. In many cases um, where you've got introduced predators, they completely um, decimate and um, the populations to the extent that once those predators have been removed, active restoration is needed to reintroduce species to the island. We still have viable populations left. We have populations which can recover, which can rebound from the impacts of mice once the threat of mice has been removed. So a few more slides to finish off, but just to say that this is a bold and important conservation project that will help improve the conservation status of a number of remarkable and important seabirds, and also, as I've mentioned, contribute to the recovery of the entire ecosystem. And I think that there can be few major conservation initiatives around the globe that yield such a rapid return on the investment of money, passion, and effort that goes into a project like this. These are quite unique conservation interventions in that there is a one-off investment in a project which um, continues to yield benefits of perpetuity with very little ongoing effort required. And I think, you know, those of us that think about conservation often, you, you realize that there's no silver bullet in conservation. Many of these species and habitats face multiple threats. And it's, it's important that all of them are addressed. Some of them are more tractable conservation threats to address than others. But I'd like to suggest that in the case of seabirds and other species on islands that are impacted by introduced predators, removal of those introduced predators comes very close to being a silver bullet. It's not a complete silver bullet, but it comes close. And in conservation, we're constantly striving to ensure that that threat line doesn't get advanced further. With a project like this, we're in a position to push back that threat line, to turn back the clock, to ensure that we can uh, contribute towards uh, returning these islands and these systems to their former glory. It's an incredible opportunity to leave an amazing conservation legacy. And uh, I think this also provides an opportunity to highlight what can be achieved uh, when government, NGOs, the research community and civil society, civil society come together to save a precious part of our planet. We can really prove and show that it is possible to do good, as Sally mentioned earlier, and it is possible to make a difference. And importantly, I think it's necessary that we stop images like this being the impression of Marion Island that is presented to the world. Rather, surely this is the sort of image that we would like to promote. Majestic albatrosses soaring safely at sea, 
just offshore of their now protected breeding sites, which are free of introduced predators. Wouldn't that be an amazing conservation legacy to leave our children and their children? So I'd like to thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak this evening and for your ongoing support for the project. And I'd like to urge you all to please help us help them and to say that together we can make a difference. We really can. And I know that many of you have um, supported the project already and we would greatly appreciate your continued support, whether that is sponsoring a hectare, providing a donation of any amount, letting your friends and networks know, letting us know about opportunities that you think we could uh, make use of to progress this project. It is certainly, from a personal perspective, the most important conservation work that uh, I've been involved in. It's been an absolute privilege to be involved in this project work, to work together with Bird Life South Africa colleagues, to work with our project team, people like Keith and, and Robin and, and Heidi, who's our uh, fundraiser. Mark is integrally involved in this project. There are many, many others who have dedicated, John Cooper, who've dedicated a huge amount of time to this project and who want to make it work. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope that the presentation has inspired you to come together and help us make a difference to these birds. And just to finish off very quickly, um, I just want to say that um, uh, Melissa mentioned earlier, she thanked Peter Ginn and Jeff McKilleran for the a donation of their book. They've also donated books for um, use uh, to, to the Mouse for Marin project, which we're using in a raffle. And um, the illustrations that you've seen, the artworks that I've featured in my presentation this evening are all done by my wife, Lee Volfart. And um, I've been very fortunate, and we've been very fortunate that uh, Lee and I have spent some amazing times on islands together, um, places like South Georgia, the Falkland Islands. We lived on Dustin Island for five years. Unfortunately, Lee has never been to Marion Island, uh, but she's heard many stories about it and was motivated to um, create um, an art piece um, depicting the albatrosses of the Prince Edward Islands to help raise awareness and support for the project. And uh, she's donated one of the prints, uh, a limited edition print, also uh, to the raffle that we're running at the moment, and that will be running until the end of June. So those of you that are interested, I'm sure many of you have already uh, taken part, that's another way that you can help support our project. Um, so I think uh, it's being run on Quicket. So if you just do a search for Mouse Free Marion Raffle on Quicket, I'm sure you'll find your way there. But uh, thank you very much to Melissa and your team for the opportunity. I hope I haven't gone too long over the allotted time and um, very happy to answer any questions that people might have. And hopefully uh, Keith and uh, Robin might assist me with questions that, uh, with answers to questions that uh, the audience might have this evening. So thanks again. And um, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Anton. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I, I've always been so inspired by this work and, and the Marion Island trip that we did on Flock at Sea and uh, certainly to see these pictures and, and hear your passion for the project. It's, it's just a phenomenal thing to be a part of. So thank you so much for your time on this project and for your time tonight in putting together that wonderful presentation. I seem to be having a bit of a challenge with my video there, Anton, but are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, That's super. Perfectly well, much, we'll, yeah. we'll do this without my video for now. And uh, I see a couple of people were suggesting that we need to nominate you for a TED talk. You are so eloquent and fantastic in the way you deliver this message. And I would certainly support putting you out there for a TED talk to spread this message even further. Uh, Ted always says ideas worth spreading. And I think yours is absolutely one that we need to get out there and, and promote the conservation of these incredible seabirds. So... Thank you, Anton. Before we dive into a few questions, this sign up or answer for us. Um, there's a couple of questions there about the show tonight and the series in general. We'd love your input and apologies for the techno gremlins last week where we were only able to get one or two responses, but thanks to those of you who went back and filled it in at a later stage. Tonight, you should be able to answer it as soon as you exit. But uh, let's dive into those questions. Anton, there's quite a few coming your way, so we'll We'll probably go for about the next 15 minutes or so. And uh, anyone who as well, I know they, they're waiting in the wings to help answer a couple of these questions. But uh, the first one I'm going to fire at you tonight is from Eleanor Mary. And she's asked, if the funding is raised successfully, when is the operation currently planned to be taking place? So we're working hard to try and achieve 
um, a Beijing operation in 2024, but that is a very ambitious and challenging target. Um, and so we need to, uh, we are in the process of discussing and considering that target date. Um, <clears throat> the operation will take place in winter time. So roughly from August through until, I mean, sorry, from May through until August, September. Uh, but it does uh, require that we um, have the requisite funds well in advance of that and have um, also achieved positive outcomes from the various regulatory approvals. So we are working hard towards uh, a target um, year of 2024, but uh, there's a possibility that we might need to push that forward to 2025 if we have not uh, been able to uh, achieve the outcomes in, a, in advance of that. The important thing is that we need to make sure that we are very well prepared that we're not kind of rushing things kind of at the last step. Um, and uh, it's more important to make sure that we are fully prepared than to go ahead um, in 2024, come what may. Absolutely. And you mentioned in your, your talk that this really is uh, an all or nothing endeavor. We, we cannot afford to have even one mouse survive this very ambitious undertaking. Um, if we are successful and if all of your hard work pays off and, and we are able to eradicate mice. Michael is asking what is going to be done to prevent any reintroductions in the future? That's a very important question, Michael. And this is one of the kind of key principles of making sure before you even go ahead with an eradication operation, biosecurity. Um, on the one hand, we are fairly lucky in that there aren't many visits to the island. There's essentially one ship that visits the island and it doesn't tie up uh, a shore anywhere on the island. However, um, we are working hard together with our partners in government to strengthen the biosecurity measures to make sure that we reduce the risk of any reinvasion. So it's an incredibly important um, prerequisite of um, a project like this is to make sure that you minimize any probability of reinvasion by rodents, be they rats, mice, etc. cetera. So, um, that is something that we are working on, as I say, with our project partners and uh, are wanting to ensure we strengthen as much as possible before we even initiate the Beijing operation so that the investment made in the project is safeguarded and uh, we can uh, continue to um, realize the conservation benefits without those being compromised by any reintroductions down the line. I seem to have lost some of my, my Q and A. So I don't know if I can ask Robin or Keith while they're in the background there, if there are any other questions that um, they'd like the, the team to answer for the moment. Um, I apologize everyone. It seems on our hundredth episode, the techno gremlins have finally caught us. But um, Anton, just while we, we're waiting and, and Robin and Keith are having a look at those questions for us. Um, what would you ask of everybody who's tuned in tonight in terms of helping to support the project? You've promoted the raffle, um, you've mentioned some of the, the different initiatives, but what can the individual sitting at home do to really help us achieve this, this project going forward and help you and your team to do what needs to be done? Thanks very much, Melissa. Um, as I said, there are a number of opportunities, uh, a number of uh, mechanisms that can be used and a number of ways in which you can all support the project. I think even just, talking about the project amongst your networks, your friends and family, getting the word out there. Um, we desperately need um, donors that, provide, that have the ability to provide large amounts of funding. That might not be you in the audience, but you might know people who might be interested in supporting an intervention and project like this. And if you could um, put us in touch with them, for example, that would be hugely useful. But I think, as you were saying earlier, Minister, every little bit counts. I think, you know, it's important Given that Marin Island is perhaps um, an island uh, that is not actually very well known amongst South Africans, if you can spread the word of the importance of this project, it helps raise the profile, it helps us um, uh, promote the project to potential funders. Um, and funding is clearly one of the important um, resources, one of the important kind of requirements that we have. And, um, and so any assistance that we can get with that regard, uh, whether it's promoting it, um, or providing funding through the sponsor of Hector or other mechanisms on the website or spreading the news and putting us in touch with people that might be able to help fund uh, the work that would be hugely valuable and greatly appreciated. Absolutely and, and are we able to share what our, our sort of Everest milestone is in terms of just how much money you guys are, are trying to raise to pull this off effectively? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a costly project. Um, it's uh, the budget is estimated to be about twenty million US dollars, 
and we've raised um, about a third of that. So we still have uh, about two thirds of that to go. Um, the government have, have earmarked a substantial contribution to the project as well. So it's a, it is a project which is a public-private partnership. Um, funding is provided by government. We're also investigating um, other international funding mechanisms through public schemes, such as through the UN and through the EU. So we're looking at every single mechanism. We're looking at some, um, Heidi and her team are looking at some creative um, uh, investment mechanisms um, similar to the Rhino Bond that was established in South Africa recently. So, so it's, uh, it is uh, an enormous amount of money to raise, but that, in fact, um, when one amortizes the amount um, over the lifetime of, or in perpetuity, in fact, you can see in terms of bank feel back, it's a very cost-effective project. And uh, in fact, um, although it might seem like a lot of money to a lot of people, uh, the per hectare cost compared to other projects would be considerably less. Obviously, there are efficiencies in scaling up a project to a large island like Marin. Um, but yeah, we've got a, a challenge ahead of us. And so any um, assistance that we can get from people to help us um, secure the funding we need to make this a, a reality would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. And uh, I see Robin's copied a couple across for me to, to ask now. Thanks, Robin. Um, Anton, in terms of the bait um, and, and the deployment of the bait on the island itself, how long are those pellets act active for and, and what happens to them afterwards if they don't get taken up by the mice? Are there any ecological knock-on effects? I, I'm going to ask Keith to answer this one just so that I can have a break from talking for a while. And he's, a, <laughs> a, he's a more knowledgeable about this matter than I am. So Keith, would you mind responding to that question, please? So welcome to the show, Keith. <laughs> I know it's a, an earthly hour for you out in New Zealand. <laughs> Yep, thanks, Melissa. Um, I'll just ask you to repeat the question, please. I was actually typing answers to questions um, on the Q&A uh, tab, oh. so if you could just pass me, please. With absolute pleasure, Keith. So it's around the bait, and uh, once it's deployed on the island, how long does it persist on the island? And if the, the mice don't eat it, um, how, how does it break down, and what are the ecological consequences of that? Yep, okay. So the, the bait is... Um, is about 99.5% um, inert uh, material, so ground up grain and, and lure and things like that. The toxin within it uh, is at a concentration of, of about 20 parts per million. Um, so the, the bait pellets uh, that are not eaten break down uh, firstly by, by weathering, uh, and that's a combination of uh, getting, getting wet through rain and, and ground moisture uh, and then drying out by wind and getting wet again. Uh, so that process occurs until the pellets start to break down. Um, and at the same time, um, soil microorganisms are acting on the, on the bait as it starts to disintegrate. Um, the toxin is not soluble, uh, so it doesn't um, affect water supplies or, or water bodies. Uh, it does bind quite strongly to soil. So um, as soil microorganisms break it down, it, the toxin molecules do bind to the soil and, it, and it's ultimately um, broken down into constituent components um, and becomes inert. Now that process um, can take a number of months. So the, the half-life of the toxin in, in soil is considered to be about 24 weeks. Um, so, uh, that's it. It is a, a it does accumulate in the environment if it's used uh, extensively over a long period of time, which is why the toxin is not really suitable for uh, mainland rodent control or um, or that because that, in that situation it will accumulate in in, in uh, animals up the food chain um, for a one off intervention like an island eradication. It's quite good because uh, if things go well, it's done once and then you never have to use it on the island again. So, so sort of within a, um, a period of, of six months uh, or sometimes a little longer, uh, that uh, toxin has sort of worked its way through the, the environment and uh, broken down into inert um, components. So hopefully that's a, um, a, a thumbnail sketch of it. Thanks for that, Keith. Anton, do you wanna chip in anything else? Are you satisfied Keith's given us a very comprehensive answer there. Yeah, I have nothing further to add. Thanks, Melissa. Perfect. And obviously, <laughs> one of the big challenges with conservation projects is getting that monitoring and evaluation right. 
what are your sort of steps in place to carry out the monitoring of the effectiveness of your your rodenticide deployment and, and what steps are you going to take to, to find out if this has been a big success? Yeah, thanks very much, Melissa. That's an important question and one that uh, we have given a lot of thought to. And so there are two components to that. The one is um, determining whether we've been successful or not. And the other is to monitor or to assess and monitor the ecological outcomes of the operation. You know, we've talked about species rebounding, the negative impacts that mice are having that um, the ecosystem should recover from. So the first component of that, uh, determining whether we've been successful at removing mice, um, for that, um, we have very specific measures that we will put in place. And that normally involves um, a couple of years after the actual baiting operation, going out to the island with a number of different um, techniques and tools to determine whether there are any mice or signs of mice on the island. And the reason that you leave this um, for a couple of years is that you can imagine on an island the size of Mariam, um, if you were unsuccessful and there were a handful of mice in an isolated part of the island, their numbers would be potentially so low that you wouldn't be able to detect, detect them easily very soon afterwards. But by a couple of years after the operation, they should have bed up into numbers that would become more easily detectable. And for that, one would use a combination of specially trained rodent detection dogs and handlers that would survey um, not necessarily the entire island, but sections of it to the extent that you're confident that you've covered most of the key habitats and especially the very um, important habitats for mice. And you would then also use a number of um, kind of more uh, passive devices, uh, detection devices, uh, chew sticks and wax cards and uh, tracking tunnels that you would deploy in areas that would provide um, evidence of mice, mice having been in the area um, that you could go back and check. So that would you would do a couple of years after the operation and that's built into our overall um, program. Uh, we've still got some time to sort out the exact details of that. Um, obviously, if one finds mice before then, then that you know, indicates that you haven't been successful. But if you have not found mice, you, you do return and you put effort into um, detecting any uh, uh, mice that might be present um, after that point. And then the other component is to um, assess and monitor the ecological outcomes. And we're very fortunate on Marion in that I mentioned in my presentation that there have been a number of um, long-term and ongoing uh, research and monitoring projects, the projects that have been focused on the terrestrial ecology of the island, on the seabirds. And so we have quite a lot of good data which we can use um, to look at a long-term monitoring project. Uh, we are, in the, at, at this current stage, we are looking at filling in some data gaps on the um, plants and invertebrates uh, so that we've got good baseline data that we can use to monitor um, through and beyond the, um, the eradication operation to really quantify and demonstrate um, the recovery of various um, ecological parameters of the island from the plants, the invertebrates, the seabirds. And the other um, benefit that we have with Marion is that we've got Prince Edward Island, which we can use as a control site. So we can look at changes on Marion relative to changes at Prince Edward Island to understand the extent to which those changes are being driven by the removal of mice rather than climate change and other factors which would affect both islands equally. So it's something which unfortunately isn't often done in these kind of projects because what tends to happen, a lot of fundraising gets um, directed to the actual operation itself. And afterwards, there's not a lot of funds uh, available to continue the ongoing monitoring. It's sort of seen as a nice to have. And we really want to make sure that we make good use of the opportunity to monitor and to demonstrate the positive ecological um, outputs and um, outcomes of the operation. Fantastic. Thanks, Anton. And I see Michael's put a question here. What happens to the dead mice bodies? Um, are they going to be collected? Are they destroyed? What, what is the plan with those uh, fatalities? In fact, um, Keith knows more about this than I do because he's been involved in uh, eradication operations, but from um, reviewing other projects and from trials that have been done on other islands, the majority of mice actually, the, uh, once they start feeling unwell as a result of consuming the toxin, they move down into their burrows and they, um, they die underground. And so they will then eventually sort of decompose. Um, I did mention the um, 
possibility of some non-target impacts. There will be some mice that die on the surface and there are likely to be some scavenging species such as squirs and sheathbills um, that might consume and ingest some of those dead mice. Um, but essentially they would kind of decompose and break down. And as Keith mentioned earlier, the actual toxin um, you know, uh, becomes as it um, binds to the soil and kind of becomes inert as a result of that. Uh, the pathway that we're interested in from the uh, non-target species impacts is if there are scavenging birds that eat sufficient numbers of mice that they obtain a lethal dose. And we do expect that there will be some individuals that, um, that do succumb to that, but um, we are, um, uh, are, are, are confident that this will be uh, something which happens at the level of individuals and, and not at the level of populations. And as I say, Peter Ryan and uh, the um, advisory panel are busy looking at this to give us a better understanding on um, what those impacts might be and how we could um, reduce those. And one of, the, one of the ways I didn't mention in the talk that we do mitigate the potential impacts is by doing the operation in wintertime, which is when, for example, um, the majority of skuas leave the island. And so they won't be present at the time that we do the operation and therefore won't be vulnerable to ingesting carcasses of mice that they might find. But as I mentioned, the majority of mice do uh, move into their burrows when they start feeling unwell and die underground, which is a good thing for, for us in terms of reducing the secondary impacts. Absolutely. Anton, thank you. The, the level of logistics and planning and, and organization that is going into this is certainly no small task. And uh, I have to just wish you, Keith, Robin, and the rest of the team uh, a massive good luck. What you guys are doing is going to make history and it certainly needs to happen because we don't want to see these beautiful birds having those horrible uh, ill-fated deaths with the, the mice chewing away at them. And yeah, thank you so much for coming onto the show, celebrating our hundredth day, celebrating World Albatross Day, celebrating winter solstice. Let's uh, hope this is, this is cause for celebration as you guys take on this very, very challenging conservation issue but I can only wish you everything of the best and, and just thank you once again for the incredible amount of effort that you put into tonight's show and, and thank you for all you're doing to make this work. Anton, I don't know if you have any last words or sentiments you'd like to share with everyone before I close off tonight. No, well, just to thank you again, Melissa, for the opportunity and to thank everybody for their continued support. It, uh, as I said, this is a team effort, including all of you. Please help us spread the word. Please help us find ways of making this happen and making a difference. It's a, uh, an incredible opportunity to leave what will be an amazing conservation legacy. So thank you very much. And uh, please do uh, follow us, support us and, uh, and help us where you can. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Anton. Thank you everyone for sticking it out till the end. Tonight was a nice long one, but I'm sure you were not bored. Um, what a fantastic speaker to have with us. We'll be back next week for our 101st episode. And it's going to be Dr. Rob Simmons and Dr. Det Curtis Scott in the hot seat talking about a bird that's a little bit closer to home, one of our endangered endemic raptors, the Black Harrier. It is going to be another fantastic episode, so be sure to join us next week, Tuesday. But from me tonight, it's a good night. Keep your eyes on the skies, keep enjoying those birds, and we'll be back next week, Tuesday, for another Conservation Conversations episode. Please do fill in that survey on your way out, and we'll see you all again soon. Good night, everyone.